You're listening to Forecast, the marketing podcast for professional services leaders. If you're looking to generate more leads, win more deals, and take your firm to the next level, this show is your shortcut. Hey there, folks. Welcome back to the show. I am your host, Ahmed Munawar, and I am so honored today to bring you Lee Fredrickson and John Tyerman of Hinge Marketing. If you're at all familiar with the professional services marketing space, you've probably heard the name Hinge Marketing and you've probably heard the name Lee Fredrickson. Hinge is one of the leading premier marketing and branding agencies in the professional services space. Lee is a recognized thought leader in the space. He's the managing partner at Hinge and he's joined today on the show by John Tyerman, who is their research manager. And together, Lee and John are gonna share with us the findings from their most recent high growth firm study. This is an annual study that Hinge conducts where they look at what the high growth firms in every industry are doing differently than their average growth competitors. So what are those high growth firms, the firms that are growing the fastest in every industry, in every sector, what are they doing differently And what are the lessons that we can all learn to achieve that kind of growth in our businesses? So lots to learn from today's interview. Show notes are at forecast.fm slash hinge. That's forecast.fm slash hinge. Before I let you go, if you haven't yet joined us inside our free lead generation crash course, you're going to want to check that out. Inside the course, I will show you a step-by-step framework that you can use to generate a flood of new business for your firm. The course is 100% free of charge, and you can get immediate access over at 5leadgen.com, and you can spell out five or use the number. Either one works. That's 5leadgen.com. With that, here is Lee and John from Hinge Marketing. Lee and John of Hinge Marketing, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Why don't you guys get us started by giving us a quick introduction on Hinge Marketing and and both of you, respectively. Okay. My, my name is John Tyerman. I'm the research manager here at Hinge, and I've been at Hinge for going on five years now. And um, I was the lead researcher on this 2018 high growth study. It's a reoccurring study that we have been uh, producing for about three years now. Okay. And I'm Lee Fredrickson. I'm the managing partner. And we're a branding and marketing firm that works exclusively in professional services. And our work is driven by research. So that's who we are. And that's what we do. Excellent. Thanks so much to both of you for coming on the show. It's a real honor to have you. For those of us, uh, there probably aren't many, but for those of us who maybe aren't familiar with the high growth study and the background behind it, tell us a little bit about how the study came about and what you've been doing year over year. Yeah. Uh, the study has its roots going back about 10 years to where when we became dedicated to doing research as the driving force between all our marketing recommendations and our marketing strategies. Uh, we, we did that for a number of years and, and isolated the concept of the high growth firm that was growing faster than its peers. And uh, they do things differently. So we began to do, and we finally realized about three years ago that there was so much changing that we needed to have a regular study each and every year on these firms. And that's what we started uh, three years ago. So in the last 10 years, let's say, what are some of the big trends that you've seen that are now shaping professional services as we know it today? Uh, That's a great question. uh, I would say the biggest trend has been a move to digital. Uh, That's what people will notice in terms of the marketing. But that sort of it, uh, I think, reflects a larger trend, which is a fundamental change in buyers, Uh, how buyers look for services, what they're looking for and what they want out of a professional services firm, not to mention uh, just their expectations that have been developed as consumers. And if we look at the last three years more specifically, what are some of the trends we're seeing in the last two, three years? I think some of the trends that we're seeing in the last few years are the role of um, government contracts and professional services and that relation to growth. We're finding that firms um, that 
whose majority of their revenue is associated with government contractors are experiencing more rapid growth. And you do see that uh, each year there's a little bit change between the industries about their growth rate that reflects the what's happening in uh, the uh, larger industries and what's happened in the economy. And I think that government contracting is a perfect example of that. Uh, just like you saw big changes uh, when the recession hit, you saw big changes in the construction industry, for example. Uh, but above those big changes that happen industry to industry is a trend, I, I think, that moves the control of the buying process away from the professional services firm and more towards the buyer. The buyer has a lot more choices than they've ever had before. Certainly. Now, can we can we define, first of all, what do we mean by high growth? What is high growth versus no growth? High growth firms are firms that have sustained at least 20 percent annual growth over the past three years. And no growth firms are categorized as firms that have either remained stagnant in their growth or have actually contracted in terms of size. So they're losing money. Got it. So I know we're going to dive into the, the the findings from the 2018 study in a minute. But before we do that, set the stage for us here a little bit. What do we know about high growth firms heading into the 2018 study? Well, one of the things we knew was that high growth firms come from all industries, all segments of them. Uh, we know that uh, historically, they've grown much faster, like four, five, ten times faster than their other peers, but they've done it without spending more on marketing. Uh, they've done it by just doing it somewhat differently. And one of those big differences was they've been early adopters of the digital approach to marketing, of making their expertise visible on digital channels. So that's kind of what it was going in. But uh, then we're finding some changes this year. Mm -hmm. Got it. So up until now, it it almost seemed to be enough to have a digital presence and to be doing certain things right with lead generation online. And, and that was enough to kind of catapult you into high growth status. Is that right? That, that's right. Uh, so if you think about it on a very high level, firms, uh, traditional firms that were marketing the way they used to market last century, uh, were growing at one rate and the high growth firms tended to be using the additional digital channel. And so that was basically growth rate on top of what they were doing before. And there was still a lot of back and forth about, is it going to change? How are buyers changing? And you'd hear uh, the, you know, the gruff managing partner saying like, well, we never get any, I've never gotten a client off the website. So, you know, our clients don't do that. Our clients are different. Well, of course, you know, that's a, an illusion basically. Now, I mean, we may be getting a little bit into the 2018 findings, but I want to ask you this question. Are we finding that that gap is closing now, that even some of the slower growth firms are doing the online thing? Yes, we are finding that some of the slower growth firms are adopting some of the techniques. Uh, for example, social media is pretty widely adopted on at least a nominal level. Uh, you know, every firm has a website. Uh, every firm's doing email marketing. Uh, so you're getting some of those things have pretty high participation. But just doing something doesn't necessarily mean you're doing it effectively. And that's where we see the big difference. Mm -hmm. Got it. So so being online is is no longer enough. It might have been enough a few years ago when the most firms hadn't adapted to the new buyer's journey, but now it's no longer sufficient. Exactly. It, it's sort of expected. In other words, if you're not online, what's wrong with you? Are you you're yeah. effectively invisible, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's a good that's a good kind of preface to our conversation on the 2018 high growth study. Tell us a little bit more about the 2018 study. Who participated? What's kind of the breakdown of firms? How big are the firms? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So the 2018 study contained over a thousand firms from across the globe, primarily firms conducted business in the U.S., but we did have firms from all seven continents. Well, maybe not Antarctica. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we still haven't cracked Antarctica on the professional <laughs> services. <laughs> but um, we, across all the firms that we sampled, they totaled in $176 billion in combined revenue, and they represented um, over 1 million full time employees and over 20 billion in marketing budgets. So, this is a, a comprehensive study, and um, I think that it, ca it captures the essence of professional services. And out of the thousand some odd firms that were studied, what percentage of those firms did we find were high growth? Roughly just a little over a third of the sample um, achieved that high growth status. So sustaining that 20% year over year growth. Now, of course, not all firms are, um, you know, are, so we don't we don't necessarily believe that a third of all professional services firms are high growth. Uh, one of the things that happens is as the study becomes better known, I think a lot of high growth firms become attracted to it. So I think we're probably oversampling some of the uh, high growth firms in terms of the absolute percentage, but their profile, what they look like, hasn't changed that much. Uh, in other words, they're uh, from all size categories, from very small micro firms uh, with a little revenue and and uh, one or a couple people, uh, all the way up to the mega global mega firms that are the uh, big fours of the world in in all the industries. So I think that that's interesting because I think a lot of our listeners are going to be more on the micro to small side, uh, or maybe mm -hmm. to a mid sized firm. Uh, yes. and, and they may be wondering how relevant these findings are to them. But when you say the profile hasn't changed much across across the 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 the, the small to the big firm, what do you mean by profile? I mean, in terms of the industries are from the size of firms uh, that are uh, uh, that tend to be high growth, those things, those re have remained pretty constant. So it, it seems that uh, finding ways to, grow more effectively can happen to a firm, whether you're a small firm, a medium-sized firm, or a big one. You know, when, when you talk to large firms, they say, oh, those lucky small firms, they've got so much flexibility, they can move so quickly, oh, I wish we were those. And when you talk to small firms, they say, oh, those lucky big firms, look at all the people they have and all the resources they have. So. You know, everyone, it, I think it's human nature, but everyone thinks that the other person has an easier path to growth than they do. And the reality is there are paths to growth open to any size firm in any industry. Yeah, the grass is grass is always greener, certainly on the other side. Uh, yes. Walk us through now what some of the high level findings were from the 2018 study, both those that reinforced what we already knew from previous years and those that might have been a little bit surprising this year. Yeah, great question. So I think some of the findings that we um, uncovered that support what we found in previous years was that um, the future of professional services, at least through the eyes of these firms, appears to be highly competitive. And um, we're operating in a marketplace that's going through change. Um, and there's notes of commoditization. So of, of course, as new firms enter into the market, um, services sometimes become commoditized. And on top of that, um, many industries are facing a shortage of top talent, particularly the architecture, engineering, and construction, and accounting and financial services industries. I think that impacts them the most. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, Also, firms that are uh, fast-growing tend to uh, have more of an investment in digital or online marketing and approaches. Uh, they tend to be more specialized to have a clear focus. Uh, they tend to uh, have good differentiators, things that set them apart. Uh, they And those are often some type of specialization. 
whether it's in a particular industry uh, or a particular uh, service area or addressing the needs of a particular position within an organization. So they've tended to focus down their, uh, their offerings and offer fewer offerings, but at a more specialized level. So those are all things that have continued to be the case uh, from, uh, from prior studies on up to today. So Lee, I'm gonna ask you a really blunt question. Competition's increasing, services are getting commoditized. Is this the death of the generalist firm? Um, I don't think it's the death of a generalist firm. You know, one can still purchase a buggy whip. So uh, they aren't gone, uh, but their prospects for growing rapidly uh, are diminishing. Uh, they're beginning to uh, shrink away. So I think uh, the generalist firm are going to be going after some, you know, they have to be content with some relatively small markets that uh, don't face a lot of competition uh, where there is need for some generalist service. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be tougher and tougher to be a high growth generalist. That's going to become an oxymoron. And now, just so folks can wrap their heads around this idea of specialization, what is it about a specialist firm that allows them to grow faster? Well, I think it's uh, a couple of things. Uh, one of them is that uh, specialist firms, if you are specializing in an industry, have a much easier path to communicating with and accessing a particular target audience. So, for example, if you're specializing in uh, restaurant owners, you know, you've got restaurant associations, you've got restaurant blogs, you've got restaurant this and restaurant that. However, if you say, oh, I'm specializing in helping all kinds of entrepreneurial or small businesses in all of them, then, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to a restaurant conference and a, and a hospitality conference and a manufacturing conference and a distribution conference? You know, so it, it's just the physics of marketing, a smaller, better defined target audience makes it easier to access them. It also makes it easier for the person to see the relevance of your offerings to what they're doing, what they are seeing as their issue. They can understand how you can help them. So that removes another barrier. Uh, besides finding you, they need to understand how you can help them. And then when it gets down to the, uh, the very close one-on-one -on -one conversations that one has in business development about how you not only understand the industry in general, but I come to believe you can help solve my problem because you're a specialist. You have a much greater understanding of the problem, the solutions. You'll probably have more case studies, more examples, more specialized knowledge. You know, it, it uh, we have kind of a saying around Hinge here that if you have to ask a potential client what keeps them up at night, you've already lost. If you know what keeps them up at night, you're maybe in the game. But if you can tell them what should keep them up at night, that's how you win business. Yeah, I think that's becoming a great question to ask if you want to get kicked out of a meeting. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. So are, are we seeing any particular specialization strategy as being a, kind of the front runner, whether it's industry or problem or, or role or function? Yeah, so what we're seeing is that there is some discrepancies in the areas in which high growth firms tend to specialize. And I think it's it's known that industry specialization is one way that you can specialize your service offering but specializing in solving specific problems or specializing in serving a specific role within another organization are really where the high growth firms tend to differ from the firms that aren't growing. So um, specializing in helping product managers 
develop custom solutions for software would be an example of how um, specializing and serving a specific role that how that would materialize. The and uh, the other thing where we're starting to see uh, some growing differentiation is that it seems like they're more, also more likely into specialize in the use of a particular technology. Mm -hmm. And the, these kinds of uh, what I think is a uh, will be a very growing trend where you're wrapping some kind of technology in with your service. Uh, you're uh, including a uh, online tracking system along with your monitoring and coaching service. Uh, you're specializing in helping them integrate uh, marketing automation systems with their, their CRMs. So those kinds of things where you've got a service and a technology where they're, where you're specializing in those also seem to be a high growth area. Got it. So are, are we saying that high growth firms tend to specialize by industry as well as these other areas? Uh, they they used to be more likely to specialize by industry, but we're finding many more firms are specializing by industry. So that's a growing trend that's happening to a lot of the generalist firms. Uh, unfortunately, the study doesn't speak directly to this, but unfortunately, I think what happens a lot of time is people call themselves specialists, but they don't really have, they're not actually specialists. So for example, I can say, oh yeah, I'm a specialist and in these 12 industries, like, well, okay, if you're a firm of four people and you specialize in 12 industries, that's not a very convincing argument. Yeah, three, three industries per person. <laughs> that, yeah, sounds, exactly. that sounds manageable. Yeah, you never want to have more industries than you have people. <laughs> Got it. Now, Lee, you mentioned earlier something about um, that the fast growing firms are more invested in digital. What did you mean by that? Well, uh, they uh, it, it's uh, along a couple dimensions. They use more digital techniques and the techniques that they use, they use them more intensely. They in, invest more of their time and more money in those kinds of techniques that they use more. So they're, they're in two fronts. They're using more things and they're using the things that they use, they use them more intensely. That so, is. yeah, I was gonna, just going to say that for the first time, we are beginning to see that the firms who are growing fastest are spending more on marketing, both their time and their dollars. That is a change up up until this year, it was always they were on the same level playing field. They spent the same amount of money. But what we're finding is the high growth firms are beginning to invest more. Yeah, and I, and I suppose that's that's expected as m digital becomes more widely adopted. More firms are on social media. They're using digital techniques and tactics. Uh, and now, you know, the, the high growth firms have to find a way to stand out from the pack. What do we know about where they're spending that time and that money? Yeah, so the the data that we have suggests that because the high growth firms are adopting more digital techniques and because they're spending more um, as a percentage of revenue on marketing related expenses, that that um, that those that cost is going towards digital marketing practices. So one of, the, one of the key findings that we found from this study is that 20% of the high growth firms we studied spend 20% of their revenue or more on marketing budgets. And we found a strong correlation between marketing spend and growth. So in other words, the more you're investing, the faster your growth. And uh, well, John and I have been looking at this question and discussing it, and I, I think one of the conclusions that we're coming from is this is an inevitable sign of what's happening to buyers. So it it's you think you know we think about it the firms changing. I think what's actually happening is buyers are changing, and the changes we see in firm reflect the new reality of how people are buying professional services. 
you know, it used to be that the stereotypical way you would do professional services purchase is you would ask your friends and colleagues uh, who would they recommend. You would set up a series of appointments. You would invite them in, have lunch with them, get to know them, hear what they had to say about what their specialties are, see if there was good chemistry, then request proposals from a certain number of them, compare them, interview them again. You know, that was sort of a, a typical process. Now, uh, what often happens is not only do you ask your friend, but you're more likely to go on social media. You're more likely to just uh, uh, do a, a quick search on a particular topic or a particular type of service. Uh, then you will tend to screen those and you'll screen a bunch of them out. Uh, we have found uh, in some other research that uh, over half of the referrals that get made, uh, the person screens them out before they ever talk to them. So you, you never know, <laughs> you, you might never be contacted. You probably got a referral from someone, they took a look at your website, ruled you out and never contacted you. Uh, so, and, and it's pretty simple that, uh, you know, consumers, as a consumer, you're used to going online and shopping or getting answers to your questions, or it's you, you're you used to that kind of instantaneous feedback, and that's the way you figure out what you're going to buy as a consumer. So it shouldn't be any surprise that those sorts of techniques are naturally migrating over to how you purchase professional service. And uh, I think, that, again, there's a lot of research that shows that over time, the, the buying process is being controlled more by the buyers through their behavior and how they search and look at firms rather than the sellers, you know, giving out just the information they want to get uh, in small dabs. So that means for a firm, you know, there's no place to hide, you know, and if people, they look your firm up and they can't see how you can help them, they're just gone. They're on to the next one because since geography is less of an issue, plenty of firms to pick from. And, you know, to add on to that, I think that um, in, in a professional services application, the buyers that are going online and doing that research ahead of time really um, creates an opportunity for firms to showcase their expertise earlier in the buying cycle um, so that they can position themselves as specialized or as being experts in a particular um, area. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think you only really need to look as far as your own buying behavior to appreciate this. If you think about the way that you buy professional services or any other kinds of products and services, then that'll give you a window into how your buyers are shopping as well. I think this point about referrals is fascinating because referrals have traditionally been the holy grail of professional services. And a lot of those managing partners that have told Lee and myself and others, hey, I never got a client off my website. Um, in the same breath, they'll say we rely on referrals and word of mouth. Um, yeah. But, you know, who just takes a referral for granted now? You're always going to get a Google search or a LinkedIn search or they're going to look you up before they go for the meeting, even if it comes from a referral. Exactly. Exactly. But, you know, I, I think it's, you know, it says something about human behavior that, you know, we think it applies to other people. You know, other firms have to worry about that. Our clients are different. You know, some somehow they don't uh, uh, they don't follow the normal rules of, uh, you know, how people go about buying services these days. Yeah. yeah and uh, if that's what you're betting your business on, then I think you're in trouble. <laughs> But um, let me ask you this, this this 20 percent spend number, I can see people reacting to that number and thinking that's that's a lot of money to spend on marketing. How would you respond to that? Uh, it, yeah, it's a it's a great question. Uh, I think that um, uh, part of it is that different firms have different ways they think about marketing. But if you think about marketing in the broad sense and you start to think about the amount of time you spend uh, trying to meet people, trying to cultivate relationships, uh, you know, spending your time. You know, normally I'll ask uh, 
partners and firms, you know, how much time do you spend on bringing in new business one way or the other? And, you know, it's not uncommon to say that I spend 40% of my time, I spend 50% of my time, that's all I do. Uh, you know, there are not everyone is like that. Certainly there are some that do very little of it, but by and large, professional services, I think, spends more on marketing and business development than they realize, than they're aware of. They only think about the checks they write, but it's actually, there are many more expenses that are involved. Got it. That's more clear. So we're not just talking about advertising. We're talking about partner time, staff time, marketing staff and departments. It's the whole, the, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Got it. And Let's jump into some of the tactics that we're seeing that high growth firms are using with a level of effectiveness that 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 low growth firms are not using. Great. Sure. Yeah. So um, looking at some of the discrepancies between the high and no growth firms, um, the high growth firms are at least 50 percent more likely to do video blogging, to guest blog and external publications to develop case studies, to do marketing video. So these are examples of different kinds of digital practices that these high growth firms are um, significantly more likely to use. So you mentioned video, case studies, and there was something else as well? <clears throat> Videos, yeah. guest blogs, case studies, and then marketing video. Let, let's kind of, we can walk through those a little bit to kind of talk about what we're seeing here. So video blogs is is just, you know, doing your video online. Uh, and of course, everyone has a video camera these days. If you have a smartphone, you have a video camera. And uh, some people who are not great writers or who are better that they find out that, you know, I can do these blogs online and people are so used to consuming videos and particularly uh, the uh, as you go down the generations, it's more and more likely. So it's just talking and being online or uh, being in video is starting to just become a very accepted way of conveying your ideas and your thoughts. It's a, I, I would think in a professional services context, and, I, and I'm certainly seeing this in, in, in my practice with my clients, is that video is especially important because it's such a high touch, intimate relationship that mm -hmm. if I can communicate with a, with a prospect on video and they can get a sense of what it's like to actually sit across the table from me, then I'm yep. going to start that first meeting way ahead of the game and if, than if they hadn't seen that kind of, of, of video. Yep. I think you're exactly right. That's one of the things that helps. And then another thing that contributes to that, if you just look at what's going on and how we communicate, we communicate in GIFs and memes and pictures more so than ever before. So the visual element of the communication is is becoming more and more important. Well, I'm I'm still resisting my millennial status, John. So I, I don't know if I agree with that, but, but yeah, I'm in the same camp. I'm in the same camp. <laughs> but I, I'm with you. There's there's no I'll, ignoring it. If you don't want it, I'll be happy to take it from you guys. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll trade. We'll trade. Yeah. What do we know about advertising? What's working in the advertising space? Great question. Yeah. So um, in an earlier study that we had um, published. Earlier in 2017, we found that at least in the accounting space, that high growth accounting firms were actually um, spending more money or more of their advertise or sorry, more of their marketing expenses on digital advertisements than no growth firms were. So while advertising dollars um, may remain more or less constant, it's how they're advertising and it's the advertising channels that these firms are using. You, you hear a lot about LinkedIn and Facebook advertising to reach, uh, you know, the targeting is becoming so much better and so much more precise that you can reach those people that you would either have to, you know, rent a list from or try to cold call. You can reach them more directly by targeted advertising. And that's certainly something that uh, is not escaping the high growth firms. 
So do we have a sense of, and we're saying that high growth firms are now spending more time and money uh, on digital, but do we have a sense of how much of that is going towards more resources to produce content and 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 to, to exercise more tactics that we went through? Or is it going towards advertising or is it kind of a mixed bag? Well, I would say the uh, of those, it's probably a mixed bag. We, we find that there are a number of techniques where they're, you know, kind of dramatically outspending or out investing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we look at in the study are what are high growth firms marketing priorities for the upcoming year? And in the top five marketing priorities for these high growth firms are creating content for digital marketing and upgrading their website and increasing their visibility in the marketplace. So what that tells us is that they're not shying away from investing in digital marketing. In fact, they're ramping up to invest more in digital marketing. And this is coming, you know, when, when you look at what firms are concerned about, uh, you know, there, there's concern almost across the board on increased competition and unpredictability in the marketplace and commoditization of services and you know interestingly the low growth firms seems like they you know they have m these concerns but it's not really translating into effective action yet they haven't figured out what to do whereas if you you look at the same set of concerns and the high growth firms are more concerned about a new competitor, you know, with a new solution coming in or unpredictability. So their response in, to the market is to do more research in the marketplace, to understand that change, to ramp up their marketing so they get their expertise more visible and can win the new clients that, you know, ultimately result in repeat and referral business. When you say research, what does that look like? Research can take um, a number of different forms, but one of the, the research that we um, particularly focus on is um, what's going on with the target buyers? How do buyers buy? How do our clients perceive our firm or the brand in the marketplace? And what we're finding is that these high growth firms are actually close to three times as likely to conduct frequent research at least annually on their target on their target market so if you have a rapidly changing environment uh and let's say you're targeting the aerospace industry and every year you're doing a study about who your potential clients how are they changing what are they concerned about how are they buying what sort of channels are they on you're going to be able to be much closer and follow that market or and anticipate what they're going to need. So it, it's, a, it's really a way of reducing your marketing risks and dialing into your audience. And firms that are the high growth firms anyways, that are doing this kinds of research, are they doing it in house? Are they commissioning it to another firm? Uh, we we uh, don't have precise uh, data on that, although it looks like it's a combination of multiple ways of doing it. Some are doing it in-house. So for example, if you're doing the kind of research where you're looking at secondary sources or uh, it's, it's a survey research or something like that, you can probably do that in-house if you have the skills. If you're doing interviews of clients, uh, we have found that uh, unless you have an independent party do that, you don't get as much truth out of your clients because we'll have when we're doing third party research on it, we'll have uh, people say, you know, I, I think they're undercharging for this or, you know, I really find Bob is annoying, you know, and they're not going to tell that to Bob directly. <laughs> they're not going to, you know, say, you know, you should charge us more. We'd be willing to pay more. They just won't. But for, uh, you know, for some reason, they will say that to other people. Uh, it's kind of the reality TV effect, you know. They'll tell the world about something that they won't tell their uh, their spouse. 
Yeah, no, I, I can attest to that. When I do interviews for my clients, clients, that they're not allowed to show up. <laughs> they can't be in the same building just in case. Yeah. Uh, so listen, I know we could go all day talking about the findings, but we want people to actually download and read the report ultimately. So uh, Lee and John, if you could just kind of bring it all together for us at a high level, you know, what does all this mean for the future of professional services marketing? Well, I think at a high level, you have a industry that is in transition. Uh, growth is slowing for some industries uh, and competition is accre- increasing across the board. Technology is beginning to take over uh, the routine uh, commodity type services or the compliance services like taxes and uh, routine legal work. So you have a whole set of people who are trying to rediscover how to really connect with clients and add value to them. And it's the high growth firms are the ones who figured out ways to do that, ways to understand their clients better, ways to add significantly more value than their competitors, ways to make themselves more visible in the market than their competitors. So we see a market that's shaking out into winners and losers. Well, I assure you, my listeners are going to be the winners. <laughs> and They're going to start by downloading a copy of the 2018 High Growth Study. Where can they get one of those guys? The, we will be publishing the research summaries on our website and in um, the coming months. And the full data set will be available at Hinge University. So go to hingemarketing.com. And you should see it right on the website. Yeah. And we'll drop a link to this to, to the study in the show notes to this episode. Lee and John, it's been a real pleasure having this conversation. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hey, it's Ahmed here again. Before I let you go, there are two things I want you to do. The first is if you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe to the show on iTunes or Google Play by visiting forecast.fm and clicking on the relevant link. While you're at it, please do leave us a rating or a review because it helps more people discover the show. The second thing is I want you to grab my free course on the five P's of lead generation for professional services firms. Inside the course, you will get a step-by-step framework to help you generate a flood of new business for your firm. The course is 100% free of charge and you can get immediate access at 5leadgen.com and you can spell out five or use the number, either one works. That's 5leadgen.com. Thanks for listening.